Greetings, dear viewer, and welcome to Purposes Crossed, where I hope that people who are called by Jesus for different purposes cross paths and exchange ideas. In this video, we continue with our series of reflections on the Sermon on the Mount. At the end of the previous video in the series, we were faced with having to choose between three approaches. The first two had elements of what I called dishonesty, and the third made Jesus look incompetent. The way forward is to do what the three approaches fail to do, namely, look at the context to determine what the command might mean. The preceding context deals with loving enemies and doing the exceptional, as we've seen in earlier videos in this series. At the same time, the context is not very specific. Jesus cites God as an example of someone who loves his enemies and does what is not expected. However, the examples of sending rain and sunshine are not responses to specific acts of enmity. Rather, they exemplify God's general disposition. God is the one who is inclined to bless even those who oppose him. We should take this as a clue as to what Jesus is getting at. God's way of relating to his enemies is by having the disposition of blessing them, and that is to be the key to our behavior. This is the way to wholeness. Once we see that Jesus is not asking us to be perfectionists, we can take his command seriously. It is indeed possible to do good things, even for those who hate us. We may not do it all the time, but we may reach the point where we will not unthinkingly react with acts of hate. Now, we should observe that Jesus turns love into something that is done. Jesus is not asking us to feel lovey-dovey about our enemies. He is not telling us to have affectionate thoughts about those who hate us. However, he is asking us to do good things for such people, probably despite our feelings of animosity towards them. But the miracle is this. When we do these acts of kindness, it will erode away our own hate. We may never ever grow fond of these people who hate us, but we may at least reach a state in which hate no longer consumes us. And that is to be whole. That is to be like God. You see, Jesus is drawing heavily from the Old Testament in the Sermon on the Mount. For Matthew chapter 5, verse 48 in particular, he draws from Leviticus. You see, in Leviticus chapter 19, verse 2, the Israelites first heard the words, You shall be holy, for I, Yahweh, your God, am holy. The command hinges on what the word holy means. Similarly, in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus' command, Be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect, hinges on what the word perfect means. Both commands are clear that we are to imitate God. However, the manner of imitation is somewhat unclear. Now, over the years, the word holy lost its original force designating something or someone as distinct or different. It came to mean something that is pure or sinless. While these are true about God, they are not in the forefront when we call God holy. God is holy because he is wholly other, distinct from all other beings. His purity and sinlessness are merely a part of what makes him holy. They are just aspects of his holiness. Unfortunately, the focus on purity led to the misunderstanding of Jesus' command in perfectionist ways. That Jesus is alluding to Leviticus 19 verse 2 is most likely and he uses a word not linked to issues of ritual purity precisely because the linking of holy to issues of purity had rendered the word holy burdensome. People strove to be pure and sinless without seeing these as merely ways of mimicking God's distinctiveness. Jesus, therefore, in a passage dealing with the distinctiveness of God, commands his followers to imitate that aspect of God's character. In this context, we mimic God by doing loving acts for even those who hurt us. It is definitely difficult, but it is not impossible. We need to keep the active element of love in the foreground, as Jesus does. As soon as we forget that Jesus is asking us to imitate God's actions, we will stray. We will then try to imitate God's nature, and frankly, that is folly. We cannot be sinless and pure. Indeed, the more we try to be sinless and pure, the more we will sin and defile ourselves. The more time we spend on our purification, the more we will become impure. However, if we spend our time acting in love towards our enemies, we will not have time to sin. That is the paradox of Jesus' way. The more I focus on myself, the greater will sin's hold on me be. The more I focus on others, including and especially my enemies, the freer I will become. 
God, who is the epitome of freedom, is always other-focused. He creates in order to have an other to relate to. He redeems in order to reconcile others who are estranged from him. In like manner, let us be more concerned about the well-being of others, thereby imitating God. And in so doing, let us find freedom.